What about um like breathing and what do you think about like the you know the taping the mouth mm -hmm. and like how how impactful do you think that is on us getting into like a REM? You're not suffocating yourself, of course, uh, but you're forcing your body to try to breathe through your nose and you're not used to doing that yet. Nasal breathing increases nitric oxide production by greater than 15%, like wow. over baseline. Just breathing through your nose. What, well, what is nitric oxide? Like, why do we care about that? All right, so a specific gas that we're creating after the age of 50 years old, our levels start to drop by 85%. So we no longer are producing the same levels of adenosine triphosphate, like exercise energy, right? When we were lifting weights or we don't even feel like we want to, or climbing the stairs gets more difficult. It's only like 12 stairs. Why are people tired at the top? We produce less nitric oxide. Part of that is we've taken too many antibiotics, so it destroys our gut. Uh, part of it is that we're, we're mouth breathing. That's a big part of it as well. And, um, and we're inflamed. So the inflamed art arteries that we spoke about on the last time we got together uh, absolutely affect nitric oxide production, which lowers biological age as well. So but, definitely a, a valuable tool, also a very inexpensive thing then too. It also kills yeah. two birds with one stone because he said, don't have, don't do anything stressful before bed. So right before bed, your wife wants to bring something up, tape your mouth like <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode, we had Dr. Cabral on again. He's one of our favorite functional medicine practitioners. Now, today's episode, we talk about high performance health. So not if you're sick, but rather you're good. How can you take it to the next level? So all the stuff that he knows about the body, we talk about in today's episode, how to maximize, become the highest performing version of yourself. Now, check this out. Um, he has a certification course that teaches you about high performance health. This is good for anybody in these fields. Personal training, chiropractic, massage therapy, acupuncture, physical therapy, fitness instructors. In this course, they talk about uh, high levels of fitness, health, body transformation, and longevity. This is a phenomenal course if you wanna take your education to the next level. Again, it's high performance health. And if you go through our link, you'll get 30% off. All right, so pay attention to the link. It's a little hard. To remember, so it's ihp.coach forward slash hph dash mp. So with that link, you'll get 30% off the course for high performance health through Dr. Cabral and his team. Today's giveaway is the RGB bundle, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all of those things, and if you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We also have a sale this month on some workout programs. MAPS Cardio, 50% off. The Shredded Summer Bundle of programs, 50% off. And the Bikini Bundle of programs is also 50% off. If you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the coupon code JUNE50 for the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, Dr. Brawl, welcome back. Again, one of our favorite guests. Very smart gentleman. Um, Today, we're going to talk about high performance health. Well, first off, what is high performance health? I know you guys have a course on that. And so I'd like to know how you guys kind of define that and what that means. Yeah, I feel I, I see this a lot with people as they get into health, they get into wellness, they get into fitness. It's like you're you're in a place for like three to five years. And I, and I consider this with medicine as well. And when you feel that you've attained a lot of your objectives, you kind of move to that next level. It's like every five years or so. So where I've seen myself just in my, my own brain, where I've always wanted to go was towards at-home lab testing, because then I can get into precision nutrition. As we just talked about in the Omega-3 show, you know, before that we did, we can tell you exactly how many Omega-3s you need in order to balance your Omega-6s. So like, that's great. But that's something you do maybe once a quarter, maybe once a year. But high performance health is being able to measure your biometrics on a daily basis mm. and then adjust accordingly your workouts, your cold plunge, your heat, your sauna, your food, your fasting based on your own individual metrics. So I think that this is going to skyrocket in the future. We're at the infancy of it, but I love being able to be there and then teach on what we do know. So, so to put it in layman's terms, you're saying in real time, essentially I could look at some biometric device or some reader um, and I could see and say, oh, um, I should have a, a perceived exertion with this workout of a six based off of what my numbers are coming from. And oh, I'm seeing this over here. Today is going to be a lower carbohydrate day and I should probably take a nap mm -hmm. or, um, I, you know, caffeine. I can actually have more today because of these measurements. That's what you're essentially talking about is real time. And I can change and iterate and modify my lifestyle today 
based off of the readings that I'm getting. Well, and you're right. And so the reason is, is that everybody's guessing like, oh, I, I think that this might be the right diet or I think I should fast for 16 hours, but not 20. No, the only type of intermittent fasting should be 22 hours. So like everybody has all of these exclamations of what it should be. And I just know from myself being sick from 17 years old to 27, that would work for some people didn't work for me. And so what I realized was that the way that I got well and many people healed, that's what we see in our practice now, seeing well over a quarter million people is bioindividuality. So you mm. might do really well with um, high volume workouts. Like there's this guy online, Paul Sklarin. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Um, on Instagram. Like buff. Yeah. He's 50 years old. Looks phenomenal. He looks amazing. Yeah. And so I'm like, what does this guy do for workouts? Because I'm just curious like that. His volume is insane. Yeah. Like 12 exercises per workout, 10 to 12 exercises per workout, three to four sets each. Wow. He's doing like 50 sets of workout. Yeah. That's I do insane. like 16 sets of workout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like if I did 50, I would get crushed no matter how I worked up to that. So again, bioindividuality, his body regulates inflammation and damage to the tissue at a just much better degree than someone else. Yeah. So what I say is we're going to look at all the things that you are testing right now in your life, and we're going to actually know if it's right for you and whether you need to dial it back just a little bit so that you make your body stronger, stronger, that hermetic stressor, and then eventually you can get there. So I believe um, completely the future is based on precision, nutrition, supplementation, sleep, all of those things. We know parameters, right? Seven to nine hours of sleep per night. Okay, well, are you an eight-hour person, a nine-hour person, or a seven-hour person? And right. we can we can actually discover that. And what are some of these like groundbreaking devices, ways to kind of test these like continual glucose monitors, mm -hmm. like HRV? I mean, are we talking about those type of devices that uh, you know kind of aggregate some of this data for you? Yes. Yeah, so we're looking at one, which is a biological age-based test. So you have a starting point. So the biological age-based test is uh, just a couple drops of blood, or they do one that's a saliva-based. And what you're looking at is saying, okay, chronologically, let's say an individual is 45 years old. Okay. So that's the number of birthdays you've celebrated, right? So biologically though, they can actually look at your biological age and they use that uh, by looking at methylation markers on your DNA. They look at what's called an APOE genotype. So an allele, a specific protein. Uh, they look at what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Anyway, I won't go too deep today. People can look it up. It's called the Horvath clock. And so there's essentially eight main parameters that most longevity scientists, this is exactly what they look at. And so it's much better now. We used to measure telomere um, age back in the day. It was okay. Like it the was fine. It. Yes, exactly. The length of your telomere, which can be correlated with how quickly you're aging. It does not actually mean when you're going to die. Like that's, uh, people say that, but that's actually not true. It just means that you're aging faster. So you're just oxidizing, you are rusting, you're aging at a much faster rate. So it's okay, what do we do? And we can do things to slow it down, which we'll talk about here today. But how do we measure that besides the biological age test? On a daily basis, like you just said, continuous glucose monitor. You know, is this diet working for you? Yes and no. One caveat that I do want to say about a continuous glucose monitor is that in the beginning, if you have if you are not sensitive to insulin, you don't do well with carbohydrates. But as you turn over your cells, you get healthier that takes three to four months, 90 days to really turn over the cells, you can actually start then eating more carbohydrates and your insulin levels won't spike as high. So it's important that we like understand is like where you are today doesn't necessarily mean where you will be in three or four months. Mm. So the glu continuous glucose monitor is great. Not a lot of people are doing that yet, uh, but what they are doing is tracking their heart rate variability, like you said, which is a measure of stress. So we can talk about that. Sympathetic nervous system versus uh, parasympathetic, which is the fight or flight. They're measuring their sleep. And it's important because it's not just how many hours you're in bed. A lot of people wake up not feeling rested. Okay, well, are you getting 90 minutes of deep sleep and two plus hours of REM? And you can easily track that now. You can track your breath rate overnight. You can talk, uh, track your body temperature overnight, your resting heart rate. So those are some of the measures that are game changing in order to know how hard your workout should be, your sauna, your cold plunge, if you need more recovery, if you need more sleep, et cetera. So are you, do you foresee us in the future being able to be able to like literally kind of what Sal was saying, like predict like, you know, oh, if I now say like the, you said body temperatures with that, and then we have biological age and you could take all these different data points and go, if I implement this now in my life, I should be able to do 
this to my biological age or improve my health by this by this much you think we're going to be able to be there like soon? yes so that's what we're doing actually right now oh, so shit. you can uh, it takes six months to redo the biological age test you can't do it right away it'll be great in the future when you could do it you know maybe in two three weeks but it just takes time for these cells and the different processes in your body to called epigenetics right so single nucleotide polymorphisms are affected by your environment so things outside of you we call that exogenous and they're also affected by endogenous things as well, like higher productions of cortisol, norepinephrine, stress, gut issues, inflammation, mm -hmm. omega-6s, et cetera. So what, they're sh what we're showing though, is there are certain things that you can do that will actually reduce your biological age. So we've had, this is just uh, one case study. Someone came in 67 years old was their biological age. They were only 42 years old. And so we, they were said, well, how, how is this possible? So we actually went through, we looked at their other labs. They had gut issues, they had heavy metals, Diet wasn't that great. Sleep was less than seven hours a night. So I said, okay, probably can't change all of these overnight. Here's the ones that are going to make the biggest difference. We worked those. We had them down to, I think it was 48 years old within six months, and we continue to drop that as well. So now we can say, oh, this person now is growing younger, even though they're getting older. Yeah. Uh, one big part to this as well is that when you're looking at your day-to-day -day markers, they're never going to be static, right? So like today it's this, tomorrow it's a little different. So what I want people to understand is that we're looking at trends. We just need to see upward trends over the course of 12 to 16 weeks. And, and the last part I wanted to share about the biological age, and this is why I keep telling people, again, that client that was 67 years old, okay, average life expectancy for a male is 73 to 74 years old. So we could have said, which we don't do, but a lot of people are saying this, and I, I don't think that that's uh, a good thing to do. It's called the nocebo effect. When you put a negative into yeah. someone's mind, they actually, then it happens, right? So then they would only be alive for seven more years. So we could tell them they have about seven more years to live. <laughs> people are doing that. I don't, I think it's horrible, wow. right? Like they shouldn't do that. So what we do then is that, again, then positive expectancy, here's what we can do in order to lower biological age. And I'm a firm believer with all of the advances, we were chatting a little bit about it before we went on air, is that if you can keep yourself alive for the next 15 to 20 years, using advanced science, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, look at all these labs, looking at all these parameters, along with your own biomarkers, we're probably going to get people to 100 years life expectancy uh, in our lifetime for sure. Wow. Like without a doubt, Wait, like that's so, going to be expected. So, okay. So bio, so chronological, chronological age, that's how old I am uh, based off the calendar. Biological age, it's how old my body is based off of these markers that we've now determined to you know, to, to give us our, our biological age, how accurate is that? In other words, if I get 10 years younger and my biological age, will I look 10 years younger? Cause we all, we all connect age to average person connects it to things like wrinkles, you know, white hair, hair loss, you know, saggy skin, energy, libido. Mm -hmm. Is it like a one-to-one -one or is it just, is it a little more complicated than that? Yeah, I mean, genetics predetermining kind of how you look and how you age on the outside is is a little bit different. So I can't say it's exactly okay. the same. But yes, if your biological age is younger for you, based on nobody else, for you and maybe family members, you will look younger. Like there's absolutely a correlation between internal biological uh, age and external. And the reason is, is that uh, oxidative stress, basically free radical damage from inflammation inside of your body, ages both the inside and the outside is almost a reflection of that. So more of um, uh, what are called uh, lipid peroxide, basically like age spots, right? People say mm -hmm. on their skin, okay, well, that is literally damaged proteins, fats, and glucose, glucose attaching to proteins as well, becoming uh, oxidized. And so if we're able to reduce the oxidative process in the body, you get younger internally and externally as well. I, there's a lot of people who say that they can reverse grain here. I haven't seen it. I've seen some grain reversed by increasing copper uh, in your diet. In Happened your to me. Remember when you did my my when you, yeah my my copper to zinc was off, and I I started supplementing like you to your suggestion some copper. And the girl that cuts my hair, she's like, your hair is getting darker. Yes. So either it worked or I'm just losing the gray well, hair now. <laughs> no, to a, degree, to a degree it does. Like I haven't seen that complete reversal because copper helps with that. But again, the more oxidative stress uh, it depletes <clears throat> copper and zinc. And so it's important to look at those as, as we get older, we're becoming more deficient in the things that we need, which are our antioxidants and things like vitamin C or B vitamins, which are anti-stress, good quality amino acids, protein, et cetera. What do you, so have you seen, like personal experience, you have you obviously work with a lot of people. 
uh, like that guy you just talked about, Ron Fools guy or girl, whose biological age was 67, I think you said, and yes. their chronological age was 40, you know, 42 or whatever, 45. When that happened, when they were to reverse it and get it way down, and you see these people, do they? Does it, I mean, can you tell by looking at them? You can. I, I actually believe that you can. the The overall skin tone improves, and I was I didn't understand why. And then I spoke to the founders of a company. Um, they have a uh, moisturizer for the face and for the body, and it uses a specific peptide. And the peptide penetrates the skin, and directly below the skin, there are these things called uh, senescent cells. And one of the greatest reasons for aging and wrinkles and lack of hydration and all that are these dead cells that hang around and they don't get cleaned out fast enough. And so this peptide actually helps to eliminate those senescent cells to a greater degree. Now, mm. if you're not as inflamed, your immune systems uh, can worry about all of these dead cells and necrotic tissue, the likelihood they can clean those out faster without being overwhelmed is greater. And if you have lower levels of inflammation, because you've improved your biological age, you're not going to be swollen with as much water. Inflammation leads to swelling and overall puffiness. Mm. And I think that once that just reduced, I mean, I mean, we see this all the time with someone doing like a, a 7, 14, 21 day functional medicine detox, or even if they go on a good quality nutrition plan and they start an exercise program, you see it in their face within six weeks. Like, yeah, maximum. you totally do. Yeah. do uh, how about you? Have you, what is your biological age compared to your chronological and have you seen changes in yourself? Yeah. So this is an important one. And, and this is, uh, I'm glad that you brought that up because I didn't know if I should share that with people as well, is that for some people with uh, genetics that are less than ideal, like myself with COMT, uh, what are called mutations, MTHFR mutations, APOE genotype, those types of things, what you want to do is get it to your age or a 1.1. That's what they found. So you don't want to go below it? Well, you, you want to. But certain people, so I can get as deep as you want on this. It's just probably un less realistic for someone. It's it's, it's uh, nearly impossible based on current testing because they're oh. testing based on methylation markers. So MTHFR, which so is methylene tetrahydro. Because you have that particular, so then it, for you, it's just not going to happen uh, based well, off that. So for myself, I was in my mid, I was in mid sixties on the biological age test. Wow. And this is when I first did it. So let's say I was like, let's say I was like 39, 38, 39. And I'm like, this is terrible. How is this possible? Um, and so then I'm looking into it, looking at genetics. I'm seeing these things. And actually I had to be much younger. I was probably 32, 33 when I first was doing the telomere based testing. And then, so I'm doing the research, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, okay, well, how do we increase what's called telomerase. That's the enzyme that basically extends telomeres. Because mm -hmm. that's all we knew like 10, 12 years ago. Right. Look at telomeres. Okay, that's it. So I was like, books were written just on telomere. And so, okay, what can we do? That's when I started saying, oh, cardiovascular work actually improves telomeres. Mm -hmm. Getting to bed before 10 o'clock, reducing cortisol levels, like all these things. It's like, okay, so let's let's do this. And now mine is just below uh, biological age which is great. So that, sh I mean, uh, chronological age, which is not really like, that's not really supposed to happen. So that's the best that you can really do now. And it's because it's based off of, um, well, I'll give you the stats. So if you have a clean methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase SNP, it's just called a protein in your body that basically regulates, how does your body use B vitamins, specifically folate, like methylfolate mm -hmm. or methylcobalamin? So not the folic acid, which would be toxic to people who have what's called a, um, homozygous uh, MTHFR, that means both copies. So a copy from each parent came to you and you do not regulate inflammation as well. And then the same for COMT and things like that. All right. So those people are going to age at 1.1 or greater. Can't really get it below that. And then there's something called the APOE genotype. And there's a two, a three, and a four. And I'll go over this just briefly because I can already like hear all the people or see all the people's like <laughs> eyes glazing over. Yeah. But if you have a double four, your increase chance for getting Alzheimer's is by 90%, 93% actually. Whoa. But I like to share with people, same thing as this biological age testing. You, that does not mean you're going to get Alzheimer's if you have a double four allele. It just means based on overall population, which is a 3-3, that's kind of a neutral protein, neutral allele. It would take like 45 minutes to unpack all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but that does not mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's. It just means you have a greater chance and you have to be more careful with your nutrition, your omega-6s to omega-3s that we spoke about uh, to a much greater degree. Okay. Do you see um, hormone therapy reversing biological age alone? Like somebody goes and they get you know tested and they're like, okay, I'm going to take uh, growth hormone or mm -hmm. testosterone replacement or peptides that raise growth hormone, right? That's known as the 
you know, the, the youth hormone, for example, does, does that then lower biological age or does it just create the illusion that you're getting younger? It creates the illusion that you are getting younger because of the exterior. So okay. it, that doesn't, they, they've really interesting studies. And again, I study some of the best people and the research out there. And I really stand biased because I want to do this for me. And then I want to share that for people at an unbiased level of like what's actually possible. So, and, and to kind of bring that back, um, I, I work with some of my practice. They're 38 years old, biological age of 26. So like you can go way back. If you wow. get good genes, like you can really scale this wow. back. But if you look at David Sinclair's work, you look at Dr. Horvath, you look at a lot of people, what you'll look at is that they actually say there's a huge difference with hormone replacement therapy based on doing two different things. One is you're trying to extend reproductive age. So that's one. And the second, or you could try to optimize for longevity. So David Sinclair and almost all of the longevity-based scientists do not believe that you should be increasing your growth hormone levels uh, and potentially hormone levels past a normal physiological level. Mm. So you should not go super physiological. So when we did all of your labs, they were like just at the high end of normal. So he's like, don't get them above normal. And for growth hormone, even though you feel younger and you repair faster, which there's something to be said for that, right? So I think of it in two ways. One, what if you did take a small amount of growth hormone and you're, you looked younger, you felt younger, you had more energy, you repaired faster. Would you do the things that would yeah. then cause you to live longer, yeah. right? But all the longest right. of the people in the world, the studies, they have very low levels of growth hormone. IGF-1 is actually how they track it. Mm. So as far as we know right now, having higher levels of hormones, including growth hormone, does not allow a longer lifespan mm. for what we know right now. Yeah. So it's basically like, uh, you know, let's say it's like exercise. You could train for maximal performance or longevity. And there's some crossover. Diet. Yeah. yeah, there's some crossover, but you know, on one end is high performance and you're not going to live longer by pushing it that way. And the other end yeah. is longevity and you're just not going to maximize your performance if you train. I, I, I well. really feel that there has to be a, a happy medium. Like yes. I'm not willing to, to lose 20 more pounds and to like drop my hormone levels in order to try to get to a hundred. Right. Like I'm good with the, if I live to like late eighties, early nineties, but I'm active all the time. I'm working how I want. I'm going out. I'm enjoying myself. Like all of those things, not to excess, like, but to like a level that based on my biometrics, like everything looks good. That's what I want. However, I do believe that all of us in this room, we can push it a little bit more if we want physiological, because I just think that in 15 to 20 years, they're going to be able to do things hmm. in order to just be able to yeah. mitigate a lot of those issues. We got to be careful too when we say that, because I know there's people listening like, oh, cool, I got 15 years, I just do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you have to keep, put your body in position to be yeah, able to yeah, utilize yeah, these yeah, things. Sure. Right? So oh, if you're, if you're too far gone, like, yeah, you, yeah, you don't, you don't want to be in that yeah. position. So this yeah. is top of mind just because I have uh, a two-month-old uh, baby. I have a, a, a two-year-old and a two-month-old. And nothing has made me feel like I age faster than losing sleep, mm -hmm. like nothing. And so for anybody who has kids, you know, especially that initial state, and my wife is suffering the, 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 the brunt of this, but you have a kid initially, you lose a lot of sleep and you feel terrible. Yes. It's, I've never experienced anything like it. There's nothing to compare to it, in my opinion. How big of an impact does sleep have on your biological age? Uh, besides nutrition, I don't think that there's probably anything greater. And the reason is, is that your, if we look at a human body's diurnal rhythm, we're meant to be waking with the light and going to bed when it's dark. So there's a lot of people who try to refute that. It's, it's really irrefutable because when you look at human beings, how, how they're actually created, we do not have nocturnal vision. We are not a true apex predator. We would be easy prey at night. So basically, you'd be up with first light or, or after, and you'd be what? Well, mainly you'd be trying to get food and you'd try to forage and th those types of things. And then when it gets dark, okay, now the real predators come out, like the big cats and things like that. And you're seeking shelter. You're going to bed because naturally by five, six o'clock, we start to get what? Less of the blue light, uh, cortisol levels continue to drop, and then melatonin production starts to increase. Melatonin production, the cortisol basically is at its lowest at 9.30 p.m. It's quite, it's somewhat seasonal. You know, mm -hmm. if the sun's out till nine o'clock in the summer, cortisol is going to extend a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. But um, then melatonin gets produced. Studies show that if you don't produce melatonin at the proper amount every single day, you are going to age faster and you're going to die on average seven years younger. 
And the night, that's why the night shift is so detrimental to people's health, working overnight. You can't replicate it during the day in the same way. You can do your best to create it, but you need to make sure that you're getting that natural diurnal rhythm. That includes like, when would you eat? Would you eat in the dark? Probably not. Like you'd probably eat closer to that four, five, six o'clock like hour at the latest. Yeah, the data on um, shift workers is clear. Like they control all factors, their cancer risk, heart disease risk, Alzheimer's risk. Yep. It's all higher simply because they, they work uh, night shifts. Is there a negative feedback loop with melatonin? Because I could buy melatonin over the counter yes. and I could take it and uh, because you said I need it, so I'll take it. Does that then get my body to start producing its own? It will to a degree. Yeah, okay. and so I don't, I, I am a huge believer in nutritional supplements for how they're going to keep us healthy and keep us alive longer only because there is, every year that goes by, there's less nutrients in the soil. And so I know melatonin is not actually produced from the soil, but when we look at that, we're getting less from a good nutritious diet as well. And we're pushing ourselves probably harder than ever, not just with exercise, but actually with stress. So we're depleting our B vitamins. We're pushing cortisol levels higher. We're pushing norepinephrine and adrenaline higher. And that's depleting us of a lot of our antioxidants like vitamin C. And so uh, moderate levels, yes. But like, let's just say on average, an individual takes like two and a half or three milligrams of melatonin uh, to start to shut down their cortisol production because everything works in inverse ratio. Right. When we did our minerals and metals test, if you wanted to increase, um, if you wanted to decrease copper, we'll say, because it was high in your lab, we would use zinc. Zinc pushes down copper. If we wanted to push down calcium, we would use magnesium. And so everything has a partner. So mm. the partner to cortisol or its inverse, its antagonist is melatonin. So for a lot of people whose minds just will not shut off, we'll use magnesium, no doubt about it. We can use um, other things like valerian and, and other great herbs as well, but it still might not be enough. So if we use a little bit of melatonin, so you can take, melatonin could be two and a half grams, it could be five grams, 10 grams, or 20 grams, right? Some yeah. people recommend 20. 20 would be like the max amount that you would possibly produce in, in a night and it would stop your own production, probably leave you groggy the next morning. So a more small as possible dose to get you the result that you're looking for. Yeah, the data I've read is like half half a gram for a lot of people. So if I ever do take melatonin, I've, I've actually found half a milligram of uh, of melatonin and anything more than that makes me feel groggy. Lowest possible dose. That's yeah. great. So, yeah. and you can, with liquid melatonin, which is what I, I prefer, because then you can just dose it yeah. to keep drawing back. It's just basically called titration yeah. up or titrating down. And you want to titrate down until you get your best possible yeah. dose. So I don't know if this is off topic, but you you mentioned how we're supposed to be up when the sun is up and in sleep when the sun goes down. Does that mean that we should sleep more in the winter and less in the summer? And it kind of feels that way anyway, by the way. It's like, if I think about it, I'm, I want to sleep more in the winter and I don't want to sleep as much in the summer. Would that be like a natural, is that something that we would consider kind of natural part of our evolution? There's a lot to be said about that. That winter is basically the hibernating rejuvenation based three months or so of the year in New England, six months of the year. But um, yeah, I think I think that there's absolutely something to be said for that. There's less light. There's more seasonal affective disorder. Uh, it's more downtime. Of course, you can work against that, but it may not be the worst idea is okay. to be able to play with that a bit. Now, wh how are you playing with it? Maybe it'll be maximum 30 to 60 minutes a day, like your sleep would change. And um, the big thing though, is a lot of people are getting eight hours of sleep a night, still waking up tired. And it's because they're not getting the deep sleep and REM sleep, but we can go through that as well because those are measurements that everybody should be tracking every night. Like, how do you literally. well? How do you track them, and then how do you affect them? So you do get sleep eight hours, but yeah. you're not getting the 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 stages that you should get, or the the length of the time in those particular stages. So let's start with how do I track it, and then let's get to how do I improve, um, you know the time I spend in each of those stages to get myself optimized. So the most popular devices right now, the Apple watch, uh, the Fitbit, the whoop strap, and I'm wearing a Garmin uh, right now as well. And so those are all great biometric based trackers. Uh, but I do not like to wear a watch to bed. And I also find that the heart rate variability on the watch is, is okay. The bio strap actually has great heart rate uh, variability. That's kind of an outlier. Nobody talks about the bio strap as much, um, but the aura ring is the easiest for most people. And it's because it's non-invasive. You can wear a regular watch if you want, whatever it is. And it, it does an actually excellent job at tracking your sleep. It's one of the best sleep trackers out there. And that's because little movements and changes in uh, body temperature will tell it whether you're sleeping or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we improve those REM stages of sleep or the time spent in each one so that it's more optimized? Yeah. So the deep sleep is going to be more towards the beginning of the night. And the deep sleep, think about this. Deep sleep is what rejuvenates the body. 
and REM sleep is re re rejuvenates the mind. Oh, okay. So you need both. Um, you want to get an hour and a half of deep and you want to get two plus hours of REM. And they've actually found that in people with high levels of anxiety, super high levels of stress, they'll wake up if they're tracking their biometrics. And it could be either way, very little REM or like three and a half hours of REM. And it's because their mind they during REM sleep is trying to take care of all of the problems that you've brought up. And it's basically trying to com compartmentalize where this should go, where this should go, where this should go. And so it's a really good metric to say, am I stressed? People are like, I don't, I don't feel stressed. And you look at that REM sleep, you know, it could be very low or it could be quite high. It's not at that sweet spot of two to three hours. And then for deep sleep, a lot of things affect deep sleep. And, and so we, the, we always have to look at trends. So the deep sleep is the rejuvenation of the body. Again, it happens earlier in the night. And what you want to do is make sure that your body is in a cool, cold-based state, not exposed to blue light. We'll talk about like the three, two, one formula in just a moment. Um, but you can affect that by working out too close to bed or doing something yeah, stimulating yeah. too close to bed and, or a really hard workout that day. Your body won't get as much deep sleep. It's not like it didn't need it. It's just like you rev that engine and it's like driving, mm. you know, let's say you drove for 400 miles. That engine's not going to cool down for a couple hours. Yeah. And so that's why if you are someone who's doing really hard workouts, better to do it before like the 1, 2 p.m. Yeah. hour. Caffeine too. I feel like you're, yes. how you how much caffeine you take and how late you take it, I always notice a big difference. What about um like breathing? And what do you think about like the, you know, the taping the mouth mm -hmm. and like how, how impactful do you think that is on us getting into like a REM? So there's, uh, mouth taping is fantastic. When you first start it, what happens is, your heart rate, heart rate variability, which we haven't talked about yet. So you basically your sensor of stress may actually drop. And when you hear that, you're like, oh, that sounds like it might be a good thing. So when your heart rate variability drops, it means your body's under greater stress because now you're, you're not suffocating yourself, of course, uh, but you're forcing your body to try to breathe through your nose and you're not used to doing that yet. Now the benefits though are enormous. So nasal breathing increases nitric oxide production by greater than 15%, like wow. over baseline, just breathing through your nose. Wow. And um, this is a crazy stat as well. And I, I know nobody's going to like do it while they're sleeping, but like if you're just at your desk working, uh, this this goes back to Ayurvedic medicine. And they never, I never understood why and they never really knew in Ayurvedic texts. If you hum on the breath out, it increases nitric oxide by basically double the nasal breathing you would get. <laughs> what? And the stimulation, the vibration creates more uh, nitric oxide production. How funny One of the is that? Old things. medical, I mean, pra an old practice, and, and they explained it. I'm sure they didn't use. No, they Western didn't talk anything about nitric oxide. Yeah. They were just like, oh, it improves uh, this, this, and this. Yeah. How is that possible? You know, That's but now so we know. That's wild. And so the, it's the signals through the whole body. Hmm. Now, what, what is nitric oxide? Like, why do we care about that? All right. So a specific gas that we're creating after the age of 50 years old, our levels start to drop by 85%. So we no longer are producing the same levels of adenosine triphosphate, like exercise energy, right? When we were lifting weights or we don't even feel like we want to, or um, climbing the stairs gets more difficult. It's only like 12 stairs. Why are people tired at the top? We produce less nitric oxide. Part of that is we've taken too many antibiotics, so it destroys our gut. Uh, part of it is that we're, we're mouth breathing. That's a big part of it as well. And, um, and we're inflamed. So the inflamed art arteries that we spoke about on the last time we got together, uh, absolutely affect nitric oxide production, which lowers biological mm -hmm. age as well. So no. definitely a, a valuable tool, also a very inexpensive thing then to, yeah. it also kills yeah. two birds with one stone because you said, don't have, don't do anything stressful before bed. So right before bed, your wife wants to bring something up, tape your mouth. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, can't talk about it. Yes. Mouth tape. That, that, and, uh, <laughs> when we look at the, um, Plead the fifth, you know, what else can we do, uh, that you brought up with breath work? So the number one way to improve sleep, just hands down is resonance frequency breathing. That's it. And so what does that mean? It's Are you humming in bed? What are you doing? No, no, that? no. So uh, they just call it resonance breathing or resonant okay. frequency breathing. So it is getting your breath rate down to four to seven breaths per minute. And it, the only way you do that basically is five seconds in, five seconds yeah. out. Yeah. And it's almost like box breathing. Yep. And you can use that as one of them. Um, I love biofeedback apps that you can use. So basically you watch the center open, you're breathing in, and mm -hmm. then you close as you're breathing out or vice versa. Mm -hmm. That will improve HRV, deep sleep, REM sleep, 
uh, latency, which is basically how quickly you fall asleep. You should fall asleep within 10 minutes wow. of your head hitting just the pillow. Just this. Just resonancy, resonant frequency breathing. And the reason that works is that it improves heart rate variability. And if it improves heart rate variability, that means you're switching from the autonomic nervous system, which is basically sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, which is a tone of your nervous system, your vagal mm -hmm. nerve, um, to parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and relax. I would that one thing is the number I one. I would thing. imagine it would increase growth hormone production while you're sleeping as well. 100%. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 to, when I hear that, what it sounds to me like, and the way I would explain it uh, to people is that you're, it's, it's essentially you're signaling to your body that you're relaxed. So, you know, your body's always reading signals and the inside influences the outside, but the outside also influences the inside. Yes. So if I slow my breathing down, my body's like, oh, okay, we don't have to be stressed out. They're breathing slowly. So let's just all chill. Yes. And it helps you, you know, get into better sleep. Very interesting. I love this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, so people who snore, so I'm a big snorer. Mm. So I've, ha I've, I've on and off had to mess with the CPAP machine. What about CPAP machines? I guess to solve snoring is probably a big deal and improves sleep quality across the board. Yes, because with snoring often comes apneas. Yeah. And so you're waking up too often and you're not getting in. So when we look at sleep cycles, you need to move through the four to five stages, depending on which formula you follow. And so you want to move through the lighter sleep to the deeper sleep to the REM sleep. So like you need to move through all these stages. And if you're constantly waking up because you're gasping for air, then you're going to wake up uh, feeling not rejuvenated, not well rested, lower mood, lower energy, all those things. And so you know, uh, what I would love to hear is when your overall omega-3 and inflammation levels improve, does your snoring go away oh, or go down dramatically? reduce inflammation in my... Yes, overall. Oh, wow. yeah. You'll, your air passage will literally be larger. Wow. Oh, wow. And so, so and the sense. other pieces don't lie on your, don't lay on your back. Yeah. If you're a snorer, you have mm -hmm. to lie on your set. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's an anti-snoring device. That's really silly. You yeah. tape a, uh, like a, like a tennis ball to your back, to the back of your shirt. That way, when you lay on your back, it reminds you to lay on your side. I've heard that golf ball. A I've golf heard. ball. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Put Dumbest it on your spine. Ever. Have yeah. you tried that? Yeah. Have you done it? I haven't tried it yet, but it makes perfect sense. Right? Do, you, yeah. do you do you roll over on your back? Do you find yourself there? Um, only so if I use a seat mat pad machine, then I do sleep on my back. Okay. So you can't sleep on my side with this, you know, right. tube coming out of my face. But then I don't snore because it's you know you got the pressure, you know, making me breathe. Properly. So you you brought up uh, a challenge that I have of I, I wake up. Uh, multiple times a night, most nights. And it's actually because I have to pee. I have like, I mm -hmm. swear I have the smallest bladder in the world. Obviously, the, the obvious one is I d shouldn't pound a thing of water right before bed and try and cut that back. Is there anything that you would suggest like nutritionally that I should do uh, that may help or may maybe, uh, I don't know, curtail how many times I'm I'm getting up to go pee? Is, what are some strategies that I can do to to limit that? Yeah. So there's a hormone that's supposed to be being produced while you sleep that's called antidiuretic hormone. Okay. And so that shuts off the natural urge to have to urinate when your bladder is full. Okay. So there's essentially there's a feedback loop. If there's pressure in the bladder walls, we get a signal to the brain that says, oh, it's time to urinate. Um, but during your sleep, you don't want that. Right. You want to be able to sleep through the night. And so there's there's a few parts to this. So first, and I wanted to share the three, two, one formula, which is basically stop eating three hours before bed. If you can do it in four hours, even better. Two hours uh, before bed, no more fluids. One hour before bed, no more blue light. So just read like on oh, a regular three, book. two, one. This is great. That's and that is great. So that's helped many, many people, you know, in our practice, just you know, sharing that with them. So that gets kind of rid of the fluid, but also again, all the food you're eating has a lot of water content. Mm. So we kind of have to make, don't make a huge dinner. Like that's going to affect, uh, one of the biggest things that affects deep sleep is a huge dinner. Yeah. So that's why people are like, oh no, I just eat once right before bed, whatever it is. I'm like the, one of the best things that improve my biological age and my overall sleep. And so I get now an hour and a half of deep sleep at night and two plus hours of REM, sometimes two and a half, three, is that my dinner has to be not as much as I want to eat because I want to eat more at dinner. It's kind of like the relaxing meal of the day mm -hmm. with your family and all that. But I also try to stop eating at six. So if I go to bed at 10, it's four hours. That improves my heart rate variability because there's less stress on my overall body. So it's very, very important to look at that. The other part um, for you is just non-inflammatory foods, you know, before bed, which okay. can affect anti-diuretic uh, hormone. Okay. And then also prostate health. So by the time guys get into the mid thirties, there can be prostatitis or prostate inflammation. Mm -hmm. That is going to make you feel like you have to urinate as well. Mm -hmm. So we use specific products, um, the same ones in our daily hair support. We actually, what's the prostate one? It's almost the same thing, advanced prostate support. And you got like things like salt, salt, palmetto, pumpkin exactly. seed. Okay. Yeah, no, you got it. That was, that was great. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, pumpkin seed. Um, we got Pygeum in there, Pygeum, yeah. stinging nettles, the salt palmetto. Those are DHT blockers. 
uh, and then specific antioxidants, which help with the overall inflammation. Okay. The last part is that s many men with prostate swelling have higher levels of heavy metals like cadmium. And so you want to make sure that you don't have elevated levels. Actually, we tested for that though. So yeah. it should be good. Um, and that you do a heavy metal detox. To get yeah. I've checked all the prostates. If I seem to be all good there, I don't know. Is it, is there some people that are just uh, my whole life? I've been that way since I was a kid. Like I just have to get up and pee all the time. Well, it? the other thing that is cortisol. So if your cortisol levels, so there's a couple of reasons why it doesn't mean there's a couple of reasons why cortisol can spike during the night. One is that if you drop into low blood sugar, um, it's, you know, some people do. It's hypoglycemia during the middle of the night that will spike cortisol in order for you to signal your body to break down more liver glycogen. That is something that happens to me because I remember when I was doing the wearing the CGI. That was one of the things that the the uh, the lady that was the consulting with me was wondering. She's like, "Oh, what are you eating right before bed that's spiking that?" And I'm mm -hmm. like, "I don't think I was eating anything. I just I my body tend to spike towards the night like that." Yeah, that's interesting. So if you get a drop, uh, your body has to respond with cortisol. That will turn off antidiuretic hormone because basically it's it's waking hours again, right? Because yep. you just you know cortisol is not supposed to be elevated uh, to any great degree during the night. Okay. Basically, uh, thyroid hormone starts to increase around three to four a.m. and then cortisol increases at around six to eight a.m. based on the sunlight or just based on mm. kind of when you're waking up in the morning. So important to look at that. Uh, what else we were talking about? One other thing besides the prostate that you're what, what else I could take? Oh no, cortisol levels in general. So yeah. what I found for myself, because I have a tendency to produce um, more dopamine and, and like kind of go, 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 is that uh, magnesium works really well for me. But I don't take that right before bed because then I might have to wake up, you know, urinate if I'm consuming a lot of water. So I'll take um, full spectrum magnesium and I'll take a little bit of melatonin, about two and a half grams. Okay. I haven't okay. messed with that yet. What about, uh, what about cannabis? Because I know it helps with sleep, but I also know that uh, I don't dream mm. if I have cannabis before I go to bed. And then if I stop having cannabis, um, I tend to get this withdrawal about a week later where I have very vivid dreams. So to me, it feels like, um, you know, a little bit of a, you know, my body's backlash, if you will, like it, it suppressed dreams. And then now whatever it did to suppress is gone. And I get this. So what do you know with all the data you have? And do you, do you see that cannabis affects sleep in a negative, positive way? Yes, we actually, we track a lot of this biometrics right now um, inside of the app that we use too. And what we find is that CBD and cannabis, like we're not talking about wildly different things, right? Cannabinoids or tetrahydrocannabinoids, they're right. very similar, CBD, right? get huge benefits from them. They relax you, which is great. So they can help you fall asleep, somewhat like alcohol. But I actually see a dip in deep sleep and REM sleep for THC or CBD, not to the same degree as alcohol, which alcohol, you might end up in the morning with like 18 minutes of deep sleep. Yeah. Like yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. I mean, alcohol might put you to sleep, but it is not good quality. No, you don't sleep. wake up feeling no, rested. Not quality, no, not at all. So and I think that, it's somewhat is that, individual. Is that back to the point you made about the blood sugar response? Is that what it, what is causing that? Because you're saying like the spike in the blood sugar could cause that. Is that what the alcohol is doing? And is that what's making it yes. so bad? Yeah, exactly. So alcohol, one of the side effects is one is the liver toxicity. So your liver's working and processing all night to remove and break down the ethanol from your body. Yeah. Uh, but uh, alcohol, although it may spike your blood sugar levels at the beginning of the night from consuming it, it's going to most likely put you into hypoglycemia during the night. So the likelihood that you're more tossing and turning and wake-ups uh, or having to uh, nocturia wake up during the night in order to urinate is much, much greater mm. for sure. Now I will say though, THC, CBD, that there's different responders and some people get incredible sleep, you know, mm. with using, um, some edibles, you know, little, like we're not talking about five or 10 milligrams or whatever. Like we're talking about like a small amount. And, um, that's my that. personal, Grams, ex my say. personal experience is the amount. Yeah. Too much. Like, I can't, I can't even just sleep. a little, yeah. just a little bit of it. I feel like it can actually improve my sleep. If I go a little bit over and, and over to it, then it then disrupts you're insomnia it. all night. Mm -hmm. I'm yes. the same way. Yeah. All right. So tell me about your high performance certifications. This is a new one that you guys have coming out. Like what, what is this focusing on? Because your other certifications focus on, you know, all kinds of different forms of medicine from Ayurvedic to Chinese herbal um, even some Western, you know, uh, practices. What does the high performance course look like? What is that? What are they learning and what can they do with that? Yes. Yeah, so we have the Integrative Health Practitioner Institute, which certifies 
uh, you might be a personal trainer, massage therapist, you might be acupuncturist, nurse, someone in the health-based field, um, or you're someone with no previous health background and you want to become a certified health coach. So for that, we teach you the bio-individuality of diet, exercise, stress reduction, toxin removal, rest, emotional balance, scientifically backed supplements, and a success mindset. That's what we call the de-stress protocol. And then in level two, we teach you how to read labs. So you can do your own at-home labs for yourself, your family, uh, and then of course you can develop a practice as well using mm -hmm. those. So high performance health is that next level. Or oh. it's for someone that don't, they don't want to do that. They want to be, maybe they're an exercise physiologist, personal trainer, et cetera, and they want to know how to use these biometrics with their clients to get better results. Oh. And we have something called the HPH protocol, which I'd love to, to take you through that anybody can do. So we teach regular people with the HPH course, the high performance health course. So you can do it yourself. You don't have to be a personal trainer or someone that wants to teach high performance health. But it's so important, just like the at-home labs, is that you know what your heart rate variability means, uh, which we haven't talked about that quite yet. And I think that's important to go over. But you learn about breath rate. You learn about body temperature. Like your body temperature should drop during the night. What if it's not? Uh, and to start to look at these trends. So we teach all of that. And then how to dramatically reduce biological age, just like I was able to do and, and many, many people in our practice. So and let's so, talk. Let's talk about the HRV. Let's let's talk. Yeah, about yeah, yeah. You wanted to get into that a little bit. So let's talk about heart rate variability. What that means? Just because I think it's one of the most important parameters that people know nothing about. They aren't tracking it. And so I didn't get deep into HRV until probably about five years ago. Um, Dr. Jay Wiles. Do you guys know who he is? Name sounds familiar. Yeah, I've seen him before. So he's he's uh he's one of the foremost experts on heart rate variability. He works with Dr. Peter, uh, not Doctor, but Peter McEwen, um, who's a great breath uh, work based guy. <laughs> a lot of great work in that. And um, I started working with him on heart rate variability because I wanted to improve that. Because if you can improve your heart rate variability, now again, it doesn't matter if your heart rate variability is, uh, you certainly don't want it below a 20, but let's say it's a 25. Okay, that's your baseline. There's a lot of people whose natural heart rate variability based on their genetics uh, is like a 75. So all you want to do is base your bio individuality, your numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, off of how can I improve that? So if you can get a 10, 20, 30% lift on heart rate variability, it means that your body now is more resilient to stress. So if you've improved your immune system, you've improved your biological age, you've improved your ability to perform harder work, harder exercise. And what I've noticed is improving my heart rate variability. Like yesterday, flew in, my flight was delayed in Dallas, my crossover. So it was delayed like four or five hours. I didn't get in until later. I didn't get as much sleep last night, but I feel totally fine today. And it's because if you improve your heart rate variability, you can go a night without sleep. You can you know, go longer intermittent fasting because your body's more adaptive to stress. So what heart rate variability does is it looks at not the heart rate itself, but the variability between the beats. So let's say your heart beats once a second. It's looking at milliseconds between those beats to actually be able to calculate that. And now devices like the Aura or the BioStrap or Garmin or Whoop or any of these all can tell you your heart rate variability. There's one thing I want to mention about that because this is important for the industry. Uh, there's a company called Hanu uh, and they make a, a chest strap. If you use that right against your heart, you'll get oftentimes 25, 30% higher read in heart rate variability than you will versus a ring. Interesting. And it's just a theory that I have because I've looked at BioStrap, this, that, and then the Aura. The further you move from your heart, I believe the weaker the signal. That makes sense. And so that makes sense. if you're tracking aura and you see a 25, like don't be super upset, just base it on just the aura. It's a great device. So what you want to do is just only base it on that though, and not go between multiple devices. Mm, That's yeah. not going to help you at all. And then you just want to see it climb from there. So heart rate variability, basically the higher it is, the more adapted to stress you are and the more you are in a state of uh, rest and relaxation. Mm. So with this certification uh, course, the if, if someone has this, they get this. First off, the other the first two certifications are level one, level two. Yes. They're not prerequisites for this. You can just no, get this. No, this is separate. You're right. You could just get this. Okay. So when you get this, you're 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 going to use these devices or or know how to read these devices, how to read certain metrics to lower someone's biological age. Yes. And does it teach you in the course methods of doing so, having to do with things like gut health, exercise, sleep, you know, nutrition? Like, what tools are people taught to use to be able to do these things that you're talking about? That's right. So it's the entire de-stress protocol. Now instead of to help someone get well, which we would use over at IHP or maybe like gain weight or lose weight. We're using this specifically as a measure of how do we improve 
overall longevity and performance. So there, I know they're kind of two different metrics, but if we can make your body stronger, heal faster, grow younger, it's going to improve overall performance without a doubt. And so some of that is like we spoke about the nasal breathing. It's all the different ways to increase deep sleep, REM sleep. And, and there's two parts to it. So one, the average person can take the course and you get, as of right now, at least you get a biological age with it. And then as a practitioner getting certified, you actually learn how to then help the people who take these biological age tests. You get to run the lab test and then you get to go through all of the things in order to decrease biological age. And for the public, we literally give this away. It's something that I started doing a couple of years ago and it's been a game changer. And it's, um, which is called the HPH protocol. And it uses sauna, it uses red light, it uses um, weight training, it uses cardio, um, and along with kind of the resonance breathing. And anybody doing this for 60 minutes, as many times a week as they can, has gotten pretty remarkable results. And I know you guys do sauna and, and some of those things yeah. now. I don't know how it's, it's affected you, but doing this specific protocol, again, in terms of energy, mood, um, re libido recovery. It's fantastic. You didn't, uh, mention cold plunge. Why not? So somewhat on purpose, somewhat not. I'm an advocate of cold plunge for most, but not all individuals. Okay. Whereas sauna, I'm an advocate for almost every individual. Okay. Was I, mean, it too I much remember of a last time you record, you didn't, you told Doug he shouldn't do it. That's so. right. Okay. So Which it's he not was for so a lot excited to be told not to do. <laughs> <laughs> so although sauna produces something a little bit different than, than, um, sorry, uh, cold plunge produces something a little bit different than sauna does. Uh, there are still huge benefits in terms of, uh, turning white fat to brown fat in mm -hmm. terms of metabolism. But the biggest thing that it does is it produces a greater amount of norepinephrine or adrenaline in the That's body. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for someone that already may have um, excitability, anxiety, OCD, uh, trouble sleeping, it, they have to be trained how to do it in order to turn on that relaxation response rather than <gasps> take your breath away, cortisol levels spike, adrenaline spikes, and people are like, oh, I feel wide awake and great. <laughs> yeah, it's because you just, you just basically got an EpiPen shot of adrenaline into your body. And yeah. so, yes, it works for that now. Let's say you are depressed, you have low mood, um, you, you are groggy, you're a little bit uh, more challenging getting going, you'd naturally gain more weight than lose more weight, it could be absolutely ideal for you. Yeah, wow. cold plunge would be phenomenal. Tell me, okay, help me put the words to what I've experienced. So I've there's been now two times in my life in the last, I don't know, it's been, I guess, eight, six, six to eight years, somewhere in that range, where I've been very consistent with uh, cold plunge or cryotherapy and then inconsistent, and then I'm back to being consistent again mm -hmm. with it. And one of the benefits that I see more than anything else is I, I've, a, I would say, a, a pretty weak immune system. I'm, I'm the type of guy where if somebody has a sniffle in here, I should just chalk it up. I'm getting sick next. Mm -hmm. Like it just almost feels like it's guaranteed. These times in my life now where I've been consistent with the cold plunge, I seem to not get sick. And even if I do, it's mild and I'm over it pretty quick. Mm. Help me put words to what is going on and how that's impacting me. Yeah. So norepinephrine, uh, which is essentially a neurotransmitter or a stress hormone, uh, it's, it's easier to think of as like adrenaline because more people know that word. So when you increase adrenaline in the short term, you actually get an increased immune response. So if you're someone that gets sick more easily, you may be more what's called TH2 dominant. And so you get sick easier, a little longer to recover, you get more run down, you know, those types of things, more sensitive to allergies and foods and those um, types that's of things. Totally that's totally He's very sensitive. And so in TH1, <laughs> and someone who's really strong so, there, yeah, they, yeah. they'll never get sick. They just never get a cold almost. Yeah. And so there's two different types of the immune system. And so what this will do is it will activate more of the TH1 part of the immune system. Okay. When you, oh, when you wow. do that. Now, chronically, if you're chronically stressed, it depresses both. Yeah. And so we don't want that. But again, in the right hands, uh, for the right individual, cold plunge can be fantastic, it's, especially if you can relax. Your it's life-changing for me. It's It literally is that. I mean, I'm that sensitive when it comes to getting sick. And I just, I just, I finally did get sick. I haven't been sick all winter. I, after everybody in here, I've been sick. And it was so mild for me. Mm, I mean, that's it did, great. Yeah. So that's, that's been. Uh, just a quick tip for TH2 dominant individuals uh and this because this is simple and cheap a little extra vitamin c a day okay. like just the cheap vitamin c is remarkable okay in terms of uh promoting better immunity now there's a lot more fancy things you can do like zinc and uh magnesium and, and yeah. other things but 
just vitamin C alone. Again, I don't believe in mega doses, but for someone that's more sensitive, more TH2 dominant, it helps with histamines. Uh, it helps with the immune system. One or two grams a day. Max we have some in the back. Yeah. yeah. So why why did you why did you come up with this certification course um, when you have two that are pretty damn like what is it that's so different about this one versus the first you know the level one level two. Yeah, almost. So I never planned on ever creating a certification. So I had my practice in Boston. We are uh, seeing 20,000 appointments a year. I've got 22 people on my team. We've got a six month wait list. It's fantastic. So we love what we do, but now we want to share this with additional people. We had people flying in from all over and we were doing Skype calls for like telewellness back in 2012 before it was like a thing. And so I always loved the teaching part of it. And so then I started my podcast. And then a few years later, people saying, oh, how do we do what you do? We want to do more of this. And I was like, that makes sense because I learned from other individuals. And now I just am trying to pass some of that along as well. And, and it's truly integrative. I and mean, that's what we call it that. It's Ayurvedic, TCM, herbalism, functional medicine, et cetera. So here's the thing though. And even in my own practice, I've been working with people for quite a long time, over 20 years. So once they're well, they feel great. They're like, what's next? probably a lot like us, right? Mm -hmm. So like, well, what's the next thing? And so I myself had started getting into looking at how do I optimize every aspect of my life with still living a normal life? And so I said, oh, well, you might be interested in looking at this and looking at this. And they started doing it and they loved it. And they started telling more people. And so I'm like, okay, well, again, I'm one individual. Why don't we certify other coaches or people to be able to teach this as well? So that's what we do. And, and so uh, IHP is more about helping people get well. I mean, that's what it's all about, right. right? Healing yourself and then healing others. That's our goal. So get yourself well and then teach it to others and create a great career doing it as well. Or, or it's a bolt on to other careers like massage therapist, esthetician, personal trainer, et cetera. Um, we've got a lot. I'll, I'll tell you this. There's a lot of doctors and nurses leaving medicine and healthcare, like a lot. And they- I would imagine more now than ever. More now than ever. They don't feel the schooling, the debt, the whatever was worth it. They want more personal time, more freedom, more whatever. And they're tied to hospitals, et cetera. And so they're coming more into natural health, which is which I think is great as long as it's the right mindset. Um, but anyway, for, for HPH, I wanted this as a more uh, advanced next step to your typical uh, nutrition and exercise, et cetera. I want to say, oh, the people who really want to learn about what does the research say about sauna? How long should you do it for? It. What should the temperature be? What if it's an infrared versus a finish based sauna? It's 180 degrees or 200 degrees versus 145. What's the difference? What time is it best for me to go to bed? What time should I wake up? And so we go through all of the research and actually share that with people. And HPH is really like a living, growing, breathing course and certification because there's more and more longevity based research coming out every single year. And so we just continue to add to that and upgrade it and uh, and then again, I can share the HPH protocol that anybody can do yeah, at home. Awesome. Very valuable. I think, uh, especially for an online coach, um, your certifications allow people to, to read labs, uh, to find root causes. And now you're going with high performance here, kind of take a next level. So go through that protocol. Let's, uh, what is the, this health, uh, this high performance practitioner protocol look like? So we started refining this over the last few years, especially when more and more people were working out at home instead of gyms uh, during the pandemic. And so that's when I started to get deep into this as well. So what we're looking at is how do we maximize uh, biological age, like biological age improvement and overall rejuvenation of the body. So we want to work with two parts. So one is the anaerobic systems of the body. We get that with weight training or uh, HIIT training or Metcon workouts, any of those. And they're absolutely phenomenal. I know you guys have your MAPS program. So people would do that and then they would go into uh, a cardiovascular based program. So that's the aerobic side mm. of it. So there's two parts to it. And, and it really, it has to do with how do we improve overall outcomes of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, diabetes in general, and uh, high blood pressure? Because I always tell people that if you're able to survive those, you do, meaning like you don't get those in life, you don't get cancer, your ability to live well into your late 80s or early 90s goes up exponentially. Because those are the only reasons that people really die. Like those are the 75% of all deaths are attributed to those four things. And so, and those are all preventable. Like those are all mm. lifestyle. Um, yes, you can have certain genes. I have many of those genes as well, but that doesn't mean you have to get them. So what we need to do though is improve the overall circulatory and cardiovascular system of the body. 
So anaerobic is teaching our bodies and our cells to become young during our weight training. And then aerobic is teaching our cardiovascular system, which is uh, not only the tissues, because it changes the pH of the tissue, not the blood. Uh, it, it does to the blood to a certain degree, only temporarily, but it, it actually improves your arteries, which again is the main cause for death in men, which is a heart attack. So we're going to do 20 to 30 minutes of strength training. It can be um, any type of hit, Metcon, or just strength-based training. So what we're getting then is the benefits again of the anaerobic. Now for the aerobic system, what we do is we alternate these workouts. Uh, have you guys talked about zone one, zone two on your show before? Zone Very briefly. Yeah. Just a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So um, there's five zones basically of cardiovascular training. I think that this is going to be, become more uh, popular talking about this as well. So zone one is just 50 to 60% of your uh, max heart rate. Max heart rate for most people. I know it's rudimentary, but it works pretty well for most average people. 220 minus your age. And so again, if you're, um, let's say 40 years old, so that's 180 max heart rate. And so 50% would be what, 90, right? And then 60% would be like 110 or so. So like, okay, that's zone one. That's basically walking. Zone two would be like a light, light jog. So that's cardiovascular. So we actually don't need to push yourself. Like you're just brisk walking or light jog. That's one day for 20 to 30 minutes. And then on the other alternating cardiovascular day is zone four or five training. That's your Tabata. That's your sprint interval training, et cetera. But it's a true Tabata, like if you're doing that, not like go pretty fast and then just a little bit slower and then pretty fast a little bit. Like when you do uh, eight rounds of that, you should be done, yeah. right? So that's your sprint interval training essentially is what it is. 20 seconds on, 40 seconds off is what we have most people do. So that's really short. Like that doesn't have to be a whole lot of time. And you get the benefits then of, again, just removing those weak mitochondria, senescent cells, and improving your mitochondria and oxygen utilization. Now, the last part, or I should say, with the cardiovascular, we added one part to this. And this is really important. Anybody that's looking to improve overall inflammation, um, cut down potentially on cancer-based cells in the body, et cetera, is something called EWOT. Have you guys talked about that on the show before? Mm -hmm. Exercise with oxygen therapy. So have you heard of hyperbaric chambers before? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So those are called HBOT. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy, HBOT. So how those work is basically get inside of a mono chamber or a multi uh, chamber uh, for multiple people. And the pressure inside forces the oxygen deeper into your body. So that's why it, it helps with uh, wound healing, et cetera. Like if you're someone who's not recovering well from exercise or wound healing or whatever it might be, most likely you don't have proper oxygenation of the tissues. Yeah. Like without a doubt. It simulates you being like deep underwater or deep underground, right? The, 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 the it's like the, your, the pressure of the, you don't feel that, but you just at, get at more, altitude at altitude. Yes. Yeah. And it's actually the, so, um, for scuba divers, mm -hmm. right? There's many accidents every year. You stay down too long or you came up too fast. Right. You, I don't know if it's called regression based or something like that, but they actually put them in H bot chambers yeah. to, to normalize them uh, astronauts as well. And so, uh, that's not realistic for most people. Those are way too expensive and it takes a lot to do that. Yep. Something called EWOT. It's 15 to 20 minutes. And what EWOT is, is you're on a typical exercise bike, or you can even use weights with it. And it's this bag of oxygen and you are, you have a mask over your face. You can do this. You, literally anybody can get this and you are pedaling away. You can do it for your sprint interval, um, or you can do it at your regular. Here's the difference. Regular oxygen we breathe is about 21% or sorry, regular air we breathe is about 21% oxygen. Uh, when you're at altitude, it's about 16%, 15, 16%, like 8,000 feet in the air. The EWAT, you're breathing in 85 to 95% oxygen. So it's flushing your body mm. with oxygen destroying a lot of the inflammation in your body, helping to oxygenate the tissues and help with repair as well as removal of waste. Well, so what do you do? You bags of oxygen? No, it's a it's a system called a exercise with uh, exercise with oxygen therapy system. And it is a looks like a um like a Muay Thai punching bag from floor to ceiling. So it's about six feet tall. It fills with air, it has a compressor. You put a mask over your face like you would for a CPAP machine. Right. And you're breathing it in. And when you're doing this, if you have low mood, low energy, you got a cold or a virus and you're breathing in oxygen, I'm telling you right now, it's like the cold plunge. It changes it in 15, 20 minutes. Oh, it is wow. unbelievable. Now you get exercise one of with this on? Get one of these yes. we get them. You <laughs> Pardon? Okay, are you shopping for one of these right I'm now? I'm looking for it right now. Okay, yeah. yeah, get one of so, these. So the company, I, um, I have all this. At, well, I have resources over at HPH. Okay. People can just head over there and you'll, you'll be able to see it. We don't own any of these companies. Um, so you just get any exercise bike you want. I have uh, two bikes. So one, I have a regular upright bike, just a cheap regular bike. And then I have the um, Rogue Assault bike. 
So like the Airdyne yeah, bike. Yeah. And I use the Rogue Airdyne bike for my sprints when I want to punish myself. And then okay. I use the regular bike just for the cardiovascular based aspect okay. of it. And so when you breathe this in though, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, you literally get a high off of the oxygen, a natural yeah. base high. So you feel phenomenal afterwards. So there's one more part to that. Some EWAT systems can simulate altitude. And so, so give you less oxygen. Yes. So instead of you go, this is what you, you go from literally 90% oxygen down to 16% oxygen. And now you're huffing and puffing to get in. It's making it super hard for you. And then you flip the switch. But what happens is you become more CO2 adapted. I know we don't have time to get into that today, Whoa. but the tissues of your body, that's, that's one of them. Yeah. That's cool. Um, and that's the, uh, so the big, big one is for multiple people. They make a small one, much, much smaller for individuals. That's what I have. So the thing is though, then your tissues, they haven't got oxygen. When you flip the switch to full oxygen, it just ignites all of those tissues with oxygen. It's unlike anything you've Is really it like ever carb loading where it gets more oxygen than it would have because it'd been starved for oxygen? Well, it'd be like um, bodybuilding. You're depleted, carb depleted, right. and then all of a sudden you have a cheesecake That's what you I know, mean. before your show, 100%. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Wow. And so your whole body is Sick. like flush with it. Or you so can mess great. with your friend and tell them, it's, oh, it's at 90%, turn it down to 16. Well, you'll, you'll, you'll know the difference within 30 seconds, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but you can put it out here in the studio and it'd be, it'd be phenomenal. We're definitely so, going to get one of these. So here's why we do this, though. So anaerobic, think about this. You're training, you're building up lactic acid. Now- all, all those red blood cells in your body then become agglutinated. It's called red blood cell rouleau. I used to, in my uh, practice, we used to look under a microscope and I could see all the red blood cells stuck together for some individuals. You give them oxygen, those are getting dispersed. But here's the nice thing now. We put them in a sauna. It could be a pop-up sauna. Uh, we uh, use Therisage. I don't know who you guys use. Um, but And then red lights inside. So now you have all your red blood cells dispersed because of the EWAT. Then... The red light can actually penetrate the cells because they're not all stuck together and you get the heat. And at the same time, you can actually be doing that just box breathing or just following an app and improving your heart rate variability. Your recovery from workouts will just, I mean, you'll plummet. You'll so be able you, to recover so, so much faster. You, you breathe in 80% oxygen and then you go in the sauna right afterwards. Yes. And the reason you do that is that you've got those red blood cells dispersed. Yeah. So you've improved now the pH of the tissues, again, not the blood, and you're able to then sweat out toxins to a greater degree. Red blood cells not stuck together. Dude, we're totally Plus, do this. red I, blood yeah, cells please, I'm give waste. Order, Doug. Come on. I'm so down Stop. for well, Stop. I'm going to so give, so give you the one that I recommend <laughs> okay, and then okay. try to, okay. maybe they'll even give your community a deal so you can do that. That'd be great. I'll okay. set you up. Um, again, none of this is ours. And the sauna could be any sauna you want. And then there's one more piece of this that we do, which is, Again, like it depends. So with HPH, we let you take it to the max, which is what I do, or you can dial it back. Yeah. It's totally up to you. Let's go. But max. I put a PM, yeah. I put a PEMF <laughs> mat in there. A what? A PEMF mat, a PEMF okay. mat. Oh, okay. So, um, so if you've heard of grounding PEMF before, it's like grounding. Yeah. But it, what it does, it puts you back to the resonant frequency, basically, of the Earth, which you might sound like, oh, that's woo woo. Okay, it was invented by NASA. They used these in space because they found there was tremendous atrophy and uh, immunological issues yeah. and inflammation for astronauts being in space. And so I sit on a PMF mat inside of a sauna with red light doing my resonance breathing. Uh, I can't begin to tell you it's like How often meditation on. So I do it four days a week. Uh, I recommend, so Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and you mm -hmm. can do it more if you'd like, but sauna should be done for ideal benefits four days a week for 20 minutes. So yeah. this is the protocol, 20 to 30 minutes of strength, 20 to 30 minutes of cardio plus EWAT, 20 to 30 minutes of your sauna. Mm. And so people can make it 60 minutes or they can make it 90 minutes up to then, depends on the time they have in the day. And then at the very end for those individuals who want to is the cold plunge. So that's we when you would add the cold plunge. Or, or what about this? Because um, I've now talked to people and seen some data that shows that cold plunge is the best before your workout. So people will cold plunge, then work out. In fact, one of our editors has been doing that, Kyle. He's been doing it. And he's like, I don't need caffeine. I don't need pre-workout. I work out. My joints feel yeah, good. No, that's, my, that's my experience. I normally cold plunge before my workout so, right now. I'll be honest with you. If someone can do that, that is the preferred method. But it uh, most people won't because- Because it sucks. <laughs> well, it, no, it's because you're wet and then you, you go through the process. Yeah. So in my practice, I, I say that to people, you're welcome to do it before because you actually, as we talked about before for the inflammation process, you don't necessarily want to do it at the very end of your workout. Yeah. Yeah. However, you've just done oxygen therapy. You've done your sauna, like you're, you're recovering quickly. Um, but if you're able to do it before, 
phenomenal. It's just, if you look at it this way, so you sweat during your training and your cardio, you're sweating in the sauna, you pop yourself in the cold plunge, your cold plunge is self-filtering anyways, you can towel off before you get in the cold plunge, and then you shower. So it's more normal for people. Yeah, That's yeah. all I'm saying. I, yeah, I just yeah, try yeah. to make things like simple. You know what's yeah. funny though, interesting about that is I find it easier, which it doesn't, mentally it's harder when you're cold, you haven't done anything to get in the cold plunge, but physically it's harder when your body's heated up and you get in the cold plunge. It's more of a drastic- Too much of a contrast. It is a Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a, I, yeah. I did it the other day after a workout. I normally always do it before and I did it after and I was, it was the most challenging time I've had in there. Really? Yeah, but in the, wow. when, but when the studio's cold and you don't want to get in, no. it's actually not as bad because it's not yeah. as dramatic. So that there is a, there is a, positive yeah. side. <laughs> no, I like the way you said it too, Dr. Cabral, because as trainers, there's optimal and then there's optimal in real life. Yes. Right. And adherence, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you could jump in a cold, <laughs> cold tub, yeah. you know, 5 a.m. before your 6 a.m. workout. Are you going to really do that though? Probably not. Right. How yeah. can you stick to that? Yeah. So this, this process just makes it easy and it's 60 minutes a day. So could you train for longer than 20 minutes? Yeah, absolutely. So it's like, it's not that you can't, you could do this three days a week and extend it then if you wanted to. Um, but I really like the consistency. The research seems to back up consistency over just a couple of times doing it a yeah, week. Yeah, good. Yeah, um, like, like the that. sauna benefits especially as well. It's, it's four to five times a week for sauna, and it reduces all-cause mortality by over 40%. It was 42%. Yeah. And it reduces all-cause uh, in terms of heart attacks, so cardiovascular risk, by over 60%. Yeah. I mean, it's totally remarkable. Worth it. yeah. Totally worth it. I, I asked you this before, but I'll ask you again, because I prefer the steam room. Hmm. Steam room's hotter. It can't stay in there as long, but I prefer the steam room. Similar benefits to sauna? Similar benefits to sauna. Yes. Uh, you do want to be in there for, again for that 19 minutes seems okay. to be the threshold. Like that's the minimum. The difference is the, obviously the humidity that you're getting with that harder to be in there. But the last tip I would give about a steam room is that unless it is your house or it's filtered water, yeah. you are breathing in that chlorine, the chlorine yeah. vapors, uh, maybe even fluoride-based vapors, which are not great to be inhaled through the lungs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so the place so I go But I like to, steam as well. Like the place I go there. to, I asked them, because I, I asked you this before, and you told me that, and I said, oh, crap. So I asked them, and they do filter everything. That's great. Through, yeah, yeah no, it can be it can be fantastic. Yep. Excellent. Mm, All right, man. Yeah. What a blast. Always great, great to have you on. You're, yeah. It's like, uh, I, I feel like you know everything. So <laughs> No, no, just the specific things. And if people want to learn more about it, they can go to stephencabral.com forward slash high performance. And uh, at least all the resources will be there as well for people. Excellent. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks, Thank man. you. Appreciate it. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 